From the Conference Center in Salt Lake City, Utah, this is the Saturday morning session of the 192nd Semi-Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, with speakers selected from leaders of the church. Music for this session is provided by the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square. This broadcast is furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited. President Henry B. Eyring, second counselor in the First Presidency of the Church, will conduct this session. Brothers and sisters, we welcome you to the Saturday morning session of the 192nd Semi-Annual General Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and extend a warm welcome to members and friends participating in the conference throughout the world, wherever you may be. President Russell M. Nelson, who presides at the conference, has asked me to conduct this session. We acknowledge the general authorities, the general officers who will be in attendance throughout the conference. The music for this session will be by the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square under the direction of Mac Wilberg and Ryan Murphy with Brian Mathias and Richard Elliott at the organ. The choir opened this meeting with in hymns of praise and will now favor us with guide us, O thou great Jehovah. The invocation will then be offered by Elder David P. Homer of the 70.
Our Father in heaven, we are grateful to be gathered together today. We're grateful to be gathered under the direction of prophets, seers, and revelators. We're grateful for President Nelson and for his counselors, for each of the members of the Twelve. Father, we pray that thou wilt strengthen and sustain each of them. As we begin this conference, we pray, Father, that our hearts and our minds will be open. We pray that uh, the Spirit will be present, that it will bring into our hearts the messages that we need to receive. We pray that uh, as we open our hearts and as we open our minds, that uh, our hearts will be sanctified. We pray that we will know what we should go forth and what we should do. We ask for thy blessings to be upon the proceedings of this conference and upon this session. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We will now be pleased to hear from President Dallin H. Oaks, first counselor in the first presidency. Following his remarks, the choir will sing, Have I Done Any Good? We will then hear from Elder Dieter F. Uchtdorf of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles and Sister Tracy Y. Browning, who serves as second counselor in the primary general presidency. Elder Dale G. Renlund of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles will then address us. President Oaks. Brothers and sisters, our beloved President Russell M. Nelson will address us later in this session. He's asked me to be the first speaker. My subject today concerns what the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and its members give and do for the poor and distressed. I will also speak of similar giving by other good people. Giving to those in need is a principle in all Abrahamic religions and in others as well. A few months ago, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints reported for the first time the extent of our humanitarian work worldwide. Our 2021 expenditures for those in need in 188 countries worldwide was $906 million, almost a billion dollars. In addition, our members volunteered over six million hours of labor in the same cause. Those figures are, of course, an incomplete report of our giving and helping. They do not include the personal services our members give individually as they minister to one another in called positions and voluntary member-to-member -member service. And our 2021 report makes no mention of what our members do individually through innumerable charitable organizations not formally connected with our Church. I begin with these. In 1831, less than two years after the reorganized Church was organized, the Lord gave this revelation to guide its members and, I believe, all of his children worldwide. Quote, Behold, it is not meet that I should command in all things, for he that is compelled in all things, the same is a slothful servant, not a wise servant. Verily I say, men should be anxiously engaged in a good cause and do many things of their own free will and bring to pass much righteousness for the power is in them wherein they are agents unto themselves. And inasmuch as men do good, they shall in no wise lose their reward." End of quote. In more than 38 years as an apostle and over 30 years of professional employment, 
I've seen many generous efforts by organizations and persons of the kind this revelation describes as a good cause and bringing to pass much righteousness. There are uncounted examples of such humanitarian service throughout the world, beyond our own borders and beyond our common knowledge. Contemplating this, I think of the Book of Mormon prophet King Benjamin, whose sermon included this eternal truth, when ye are in the service of your fellow beings, ye are only in the service of your God. Much welfare and humanitarian service to our fellow beings is taught and practiced by The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and by us as its members. For example, we fast at the first of each month and contribute at least the equivalent of the uneaten meals to help those in need in our own congregations. The Church also makes enormous contributions for humanitarian and other services throughout the world. Despite all that our Church does directly, most humanitarian service to the children of God worldwide is carried out by persons and organizations having no formal connection with our Church. As one of our apostles observed, quote, God is using more than one people for the accomplishment of His great and marvelous work. It is too vast, too arduous for any one people, end of quote. As members of the Restored Church, we need to be more aware and more appreciative of the service of others. The Church of Jesus Christ is committed to serving those in need, and it is also committed to cooperating with others in that effort. We recently made a large gift to the United Nations World Food Program. Over the many decades of our humanitarian work, two organizations stand out as key collaborators projects with the Red Cross and Red Crescent agencies in dozens of countries have provided the children of God crucial relief during natural disasters and conflicts. Likewise, we have a long record of assistance with Catholic relief services. These organizations have taught us much about world-class relief. We have also had fruitful collaborations with other organizations, including Muslim Aid, Water for People, and ISRA Aid, to name just a few. While each humanitarian organization has its own areas of specialization, we share the common goal of relieving suffering among God's children. All of this is part of God's work for his children. Modern revelation teaches that our Savior Jesus Christ is the true light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. By this, all the children of God are enlightened to serve him and one another to the best of their knowledge and ability. The Book of Mormon teaches that everything which inviteth and enticeth to do good and to love God and to serve Him is inspired of God. Continuing, For behold, the Spirit of Christ is given to every man that he may know good from evil. Wherefore I show unto you the way to judge, for everything which inviteth to do good and to persuade to believe in Christ is sent forth by the power and gift of Christ. And now, my brethren, ye know the light by which ye may judge which light is the light of Christ." End of quote. Here are some examples of children of God helping other children of God in their vital needs for food, medical care, and teaching. Two years ago, the Kandaris, a Sikh, husband and wife in the United Arab Emirates 
personally launched a remarkable effort to feed the hungry. Through the Guru Nanak Darbar Sikh Temple, they are currently serving over 30,000 vegetarian meals every weekend to anyone who enters their doors, regardless of religion or race. Dr. Kandari explains, we believe that all are one. We are children of one God, and we are here to serve humanity." End of quote. The provision of medical and dental care to those in need is another example. In Chicago, I met a Syrian-American critical care physician, Dr. Zahir Salul. He is one of the founders of Med Global, which organizes medical professionals to volunteer their time, skills, knowledge, and leadership to help others in crisis, such as in the Syrian war where Dr. Salul risked his life in giving medical care to civilians. MedGlobal and similar organizations, including many Latter-day Saint professionals, demonstrate that God is moving professionals of faith to bring the poor and needy relief worldwide. Many unselfish children of God are involved in teaching efforts, also worldwide. A good example, known to us through our humanitarian efforts, is the activity of a man known as Mr. Gabriel, who has been a refugee from various conflicts on several occasions. He recently observed that hundreds of thousands of refugee children in East Africa needed help to keep their hopes alive and their minds active. He organized other teachers in the refugee population in what they called tree schools, where children were gathered for lessons under the shade of a tree. He did not wait for others to organize or direct but personally led efforts that have provided learning opportunities for thousands of primary school children during stressful years of displacement. Of course, these three examples do not mean that everything said or done by organizations or individuals purporting to be good or of God is truly that. These examples do show that God inspires many organizations and individuals to do much good. It also shows that more of us should be recognizing the good done by others and supporting it as we have the time and means to do so. Here are some examples of service the Church supports and which our members and other good people and organizations also support with individual donations of time and money. I begin with religious freedom. In supporting that, we serve our own interests, but also the interests of other religions. As our first president, Joseph Smith, taught, we claim the privilege of worshiping Almighty God according to the dictates of our own conscience and allow all men the same privilege let them worship how, where, or what they may. Other examples of the Restored Church's humanitarian and other assistance that are also supported voluntarily by our members are our well-known schools, colleges, and universities, and our less well-known but now published large donations for the relief of those suffering from the destructions and dislocations of natural disasters like tornadoes and earthquakes. Other charitable activities our members support by their voluntary donations and efforts are too numerous to list, but just mentioning these few will suggest their variety and importance. Combating racism and other prejudices, research on how to prevent and cure diseases, helping the disabled, supporting music organizations, and improving the moral and physical environment for all. All of the humanitarian efforts of the Church of Jesus Christ seek to follow the example of a righteous people described in the Book of Mormon, quote, and thus in their prosperous circumstances, they did not send away any who were naked or that were hungry or that were sick 
and they were liberal to all, both old and young, both bond and free, both male and female, whether out of the church or in the church." End of quote. I testify of Jesus Christ, whose light and spirit guides all of the children of God in helping the poor and distressed throughout the world. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. In preparing for this message today, I have felt strong promptings to address the young women and young men. I'm also speaking to those who used to be young, even to those who can't really remember it anymore. <laughs> and I speak to all who love our young people and want them to succeed in life. For the rising generation, I have a message especially for you from our Savior, Jesus Christ. My dear young friends, if the Savior were here right now, what would he say to you? I believe he would start by expressing his deep love for you. He might say it with words, but it would also flow so strongly just from his presence that it would be unmistakable, reaching deep into your heart 
filling your whole soul. And yet, because we are all weak and imperfect, some concerns might creep into your mind. You might remember mistakes you've made, times you gave in to temptation, things you wish you hadn't done or wished you had done better. The Savior would sense that, and I believe he would assure you with words he has spoken in the scriptures. Fear not, doubt not, be of good cheer, let not your heart be troubled. I don't think he would make excuses for your mistakes. He wouldn't minimize them, no. He would ask you to repent, to leave your sins behind, to change so he can forgive you. He would remind you that 2,000 years ago he took those sins upon himself so that you could repent. That is part of the plan of happiness gifted to us from our loving Heavenly Father. Jesus might point out that your covenants with him made when you were baptized and renewed each time you partake of the sacrament, give you a special connection with him. The kind of connection the scriptures described as being yoked together so that with his help you can carry any burden. I believe the Savior Jesus Christ would want you to see, feel, and know that he is your strength, that with his help there are no limits to what you can accomplish, that your potential is limitless. He would want you to see yourself the way he sees you, and that is very different from the way the world sees you. The Savior would declare in no uncertain terms that you are a daughter or a son of the Almighty God. Your Heavenly Father is the most glorious being in the universe, full of love, joy, purity, holiness, light, grace, and truth. And one day, he wants you to inherit all he has. It is the reason why you are on the earth to learn, grow, and progress, and become everything your Father in Heaven has created for you. To make this possible, he sent Jesus Christ to be your Savior. It's a purpose behind his great plan of happiness, his church, his priesthood, the scriptures, all of it. That is your destiny. That is your future. That is your choice. At the heart of God's plan for your happiness is your power to choose. Of course, your Heavenly Father wants you to choose eternal joy with Him, and He will help you to achieve it, but He would never force it upon you. So He allows you to choose light or darkness, good or evil, joy or misery, eternal life or spiritual death. It sounds like an easy choice, doesn't it? But somehow, here on earth, it seems more complicated than it ought to be. The problem is that we don't always see things as clearly as we would like to. The Apostle Paul compared it to looking through a glass darkly. There's a lot of confusion in the world about what is right and wrong. Truth gets twisted to make evil seem good and good seem evil. But when you earnestly seek the truth, eternal, unchanging truth, your choices become much clearer. Yes, you still have temptations and trials. Bad things will happen, puzzling things, tragic things. But you can manage when you know who you are, why you are here, and when you trust God. So where do you find truth? It is contained in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the fullness of that gospel is taught 
In the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. When you have important choices to make, Jesus Christ and his restored gospel are the best choice. When you have questions, Jesus Christ and his restored gospel are the best answer. When you feel weak, Jesus Christ is your strength. He gives power to the weary, and to those who feel powerless, he increases strength. They who wait upon the Lord will be renewed by his strength. To help you find the way and to help you make Christ's doctrine the guiding influence in your life, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has prepared a new resource, a revised version of For the Strength of Youth. For over 50 years, For the Strength of Youth has been a guide for generations of Latter-day Saints youth. I always keep a copy in my pocket close to my heart, and I share it with people who are curious about our standards. It has been updated and refreshed to better cope with the challenges and temptations of our day. The new version for, for the strength of youth is now available. Now, today, online, in 50 different languages, and will be a significant help for making choices in your life. Please embrace it as your own and share it with your friends. This new version of For the Strength of Youth is subtitled A Guide for Making Choices. To be very clear, the best guide you can possibly have for making choices is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the strength of youth. So the purpose of For the Strength of Youth is to point you to Him. It teaches you eternal truth of His restored gospel, the truth about who you are, who He is, and what you can accomplish with His strength. It teaches you how to make righteous choices based on those eternal truths. It's also important to know what For the Strength of Youth does not do. It doesn't make decisions for you. It doesn't give you a yes or no about every choice you might ever face. For the Strength of Youth focuses on the foundation for your choices. It focuses on values, principles, and doctrine instead of every specific behavior. The Lord, through his prophets, has always been guiding us in that direction. President Nelson is pleading with us to increase our spiritual capacity to receive revelation. He is inviting us to hear him. He is calling us to follow him in higher and holier ways. And we are learning in a similar way every week in Come, Follow Me. I suppose the guide could give you long lists of clothes you shouldn't wear, words you shouldn't say, and movies you shouldn't watch. But would that really be helpful in a global church? Would such an approach truly prepare you for a lifetime of Christ-like living? Joel Smith said, I teach them correct principles, and they govern themselves. And King Benjamin told his people in the Book of Mormon, I cannot tell you all the things whereby ye may commit sin, for there are diverse ways and means, even so many, that I cannot number them. And King Benjamin went on to say, But this much I can tell you. Watch yourselves, and your thoughts, and your words, and your deeds, and observe the commandments of God, and continue in the faith of our Lord even unto the end of your lives. Is it wrong to have rules? Of course not. We all need them every day. But is it wrong to focus only on rules instead of focusing on the Savior? 
you need to know the whys and the hows, and then consider the consequences of your choices. You need to put your trust in Jesus Christ. He will lead you the right way. He is your strength. Now, for the strength of youth is bold in declaring the doctrine of Jesus Christ. It is bold in inviting you to make choices based on Christ's doctrine. And it is bold in describing the blessings of Jesus Christ, which promises those who follow his way. President Nelson taught, when your greatest desire is to let God prevail in your life, many decisions become easier. Many issues become non-issues. You know how best to groom yourself. You know what to watch and read, where to spend your time, and with whom to associate. You know that you want what you want to accomplish. You know the kind of person you want to become." End of quote. Jesus Christ has very high standards for his followers. And the invitation to earnestly seek his will and live by his truth is the highest standard possible. Important temporal and spiritual choices should not only be based on personal preferences or what is convenient or popular. The Lord is not saying, do whatever you want. He is saying, let God prevail. He is saying, come follow me. He is saying, live in a holier, higher, more mature way. He is saying, keep my commandments. Jesus Christ is our perfect example, and we strive with all the energy of our soul to follow him. My dear friends, let me repeat. If the Savior were standing here today, he would express his endless love for you, his complete confidence in you. He would tell you that you can do this. You can build a joyful, happy life because Jesus Christ is your strength. You can find confidence, peace, safety, happiness, and belonging now and eternally because you will find all of it in Jesus Christ, in his gospel, and in his church. Of this I bear my solemn witness as an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ and leave you my heartfelt blessing in deep gratitude and love for you, each one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Brothers and sisters, how humbled I am to stand before you this morning. I knit my heart with yours in gratitude to be assembled wherever you are across the world to hear messages from prophets, apostles, seers, revelators, and leaders in God's kingdom. We figuratively become like the people of King Benjamin's day, pitching our tents and having our doors open and directed towards God's prophet on the earth. President Russell M. Nelson. I've had poor eyesight for as long as I can remember, and I've always needed the aid of prescription lenses to correct my vision. When I open my eyes every morning, the world appears very disorienting. Everything is out of focus, grainy, and distorted. Even my dear husband is more reminiscent of an abstract portrait than the well-loved and comforting figure he really is. My reflexive need before I do anything else at the start of my day is to reach for my glasses to help me make sense of my surroundings and enjoy a more vibrant experience as they help me navigate throughout my day. Over the years, I've come to recognize that this behavior illustrates my daily dependence on two things. First, a tool that helps me to clarify, focus, and ground the world around me. And second, a need for tangible guidance to continually point me in the right direction. This simple routine practice mirrors to me a significant observation about our relationship with our Savior, Jesus Christ. In our lives that are often filled with questions, worries, pressures, and opportunities, 
our Savior's love for us individually and as his covenant children, along with his teachings and laws, are available daily resources that we can depend on to be a light which shineth, enlightening our eyes and quickening our understandings. As we seek for the blessings of the Spirit in our lives, we will be able to, as Jacob taught, see things as they really are and as they really will be. As covenant children of God, we have been uniquely blessed with a rich supply of divinely appointed tools to improve our spiritual vision. The words and teachings of Jesus Christ, as recorded in scriptures and messages from his chosen prophets, and his spirit received through daily prayer, regular temple attendance, and through the weekly ordinance of the sacrament, can help to provide and restore peace and provide the necessary gift of discernment that brings Christ's light and his understanding to the corners of our life and in a world that may be cloudy. The Savior can also be our compass and our pilot as we steer through both the calm and the turbulent waters of life. He can make plain the correct path that leads us to our eternal destination. So what would he have us see and where would he have us go? Our dear prophet has taught that our focus must be riveted on the Savior and his gospel and that we must strive to look unto him in every thought. President Nelson has also promised that nothing invites the Spirit more than fixing your focus on Jesus Christ. He will lead and guide you in your personal life if you will make time for him in your life each and every day. Friends, Jesus Christ is both the purpose of our focus and the intent of our destination. To help us to remain fixed and heading in the right direction, the Savior invites us to see our lives through him in order to see more of him in our lives. I've come to learn more about this specific invitation through my study of the Old Testament. The law of Moses was given to the early Israelites as a preparatory gospel designed to ready the people for a higher covenant relationship with God through Jesus Christ. The law, rich with symbolism, pointing believers to look forward to the coming and atonement of Jesus Christ, was meant to help the people of Israel focus on the Savior by practicing faith in him, his sacrifice and his laws and commandments in their lives, intending to bring them to a greater understanding of their Redeemer. Just as we are today, God's ancient people were invited to see their lives through him in order to see more of him in their lives. But by the time of the Savior's ministry, the Israelites had lost sight of Christ in their observances, setting him aside and adding to the law unauthorized practices that had no instructive symbolism, pointing to the true and only source of their salvation and redemption, Jesus Christ. The everyday world of the Israelites had become disoriented and obscure. The children of Israel in this state believed that the practices and rituals of the law were the path to personal salvation and in part reduced the law of Moses to a set of protocols administered to rule civilian life. This required the Savior to restore focus and clarity to his gospel. Ultimately, a great portion of the Israelites rejected his message, even going so far as to accuse the Savior, he who gave the law and declared that he was the law and the light of breaking it. Yet, Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount, speaking on the law of Moses declared, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Then the Savior through his eternal atonement ended the codes, regulations, and ceremonial practices observed by the people of Israel at that time. His final sacrifice led the shift from sacrificial burnt offerings to our rendering of a broken heart and a contrite spirit, from the ordinance of sacrifice to the ordinance of sacrament. President M. Russell Ballard teaching on the subject said, in a sense, the sacrifice changed from the offering to the offerer. When we bring our offering to the Savior, we are being invited to see more of Jesus Christ in our lives as we humbly submit our will to him in recognition and understanding of his perfect submission to the will of the Father. When we fix our sight on Jesus Christ, we recognize and we understand that he is the only source and way to receive forgiveness and redemption, 
even unto eternal life and exaltation. As an early follower of the gospel, I encountered many who observed and perceived changes in my behaviors, practices, and choices after I joined the church. They were curious about the whys of what they were seeing, why I chose to be baptized and join this congregation of believers, even the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, why I refrain from certain practices on the Sabbath, why I'm faithful in keeping the Word of Wisdom, why I read the Book of Mormon, why I believe in and incorporate the teachings of modern-day prophets and apostles into my life, why I attend weekly church meetings, why I invite others to come and see, come and help, come and stay, and come and belong. At the time, those questions felt overwhelming and transparently sometimes accusatory. But as I grappled, grappled with people's scrutiny, I came to realize that their probing was in fact my first invitation to pick up and put on a pair of spiritual lenses to clarify, focus, and solidify what motivated my adherence to gospel practices and standards. What was the source of my testimony? Was I only carrying out outward performances without allowing those practices connected to God's laws to strengthen my faith in Christ or demonstrate understanding that Jesus Christ is the only source of power in my observances? Through rigorous effort to look to and for Jesus Christ in my every thought and deed, my eyes were enlightened and my understanding quickened to recognize that Jesus Christ was calling for me to come unto him. From this early season of discipleship in my youth, I can recall an invitation extended to me by the missionaries to join them as they taught the gospel to a group of young girls my age. One evening, seating in the family home of one of these young women, their tender question of why I believe pricked my heart and allowed me to testify to them with deepened understanding of the Lord's vision about the spiritual motivations of my discipleship and has refined my testimony going forward. I learned then, as I know now, that our Savior Jesus Christ directs our feet to meeting houses each week to partake of his sacrament, to the house of the Lord to make covenants with him, to the scriptures and teachings of prophets to learn of his words. He directs our mouths to testify of him, our hands to lift and serve as he would lift and serve, our eyes to see the world and each other as he does, as they really are, and as they really will be. And as we allow him to direct us in all things, we receive testimony that all things denote there is a God. Because where we look for him, we will find him each and every day. This I testify in the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Like many of you, I have been greatly influenced by Elder Dieter F. Uchtdorf over the years. That explains, at least in part, what I'm about to say. So, with apologies to him. Well-trained airplane pilots <laughs> fly within the capacity of their aircraft and follow directions from air traffic controllers regarding runway use and flight path. Simply stated, pilots operate within a framework. No matter how brilliant or talented they are, only by flying within this framework can pilots safely unleash the enormous potential of an airplane to accomplish its miraculous objectives. In a similar way, we receive personal revelation within a framework. After baptism, we're given a majestic yet practical gift, the gift of the Holy Ghost. As we strive to stay on the covenant path, it's the Holy Ghost that will show us all things that we should do. When we're unsure or uneasy, we can ask God for help. The Savior's promise could not be clearer. Ask, and it shall be given you. For everyone that asketh receiveth. With the help of the Holy Ghost, we can transform our divine nature into our eternal destiny. 
The promise of personal revelation through the Holy Ghost is awe-inspiring, much like an airplane in flight. And, and like airplane pilots, we need to understand the framework within which the Holy Ghost functions to provide personal revelation. When we operate within the framework, the Holy Ghost can unleash astonishing insight, direction, and comfort. Outside of that framework, no matter our brilliance or talent, we can be deceived and crash and burn. The scriptures form the first element of this framework for personal revelation. Feasting on the words of Christ, as found in the scriptures, stimulates personal revelation. Elder Robert D. Hale said, When we want to speak to God, we pray. And when we want Him to speak to us, we search the scriptures. The scriptures also teach us how to receive personal revelation, and we ask for what is right and good and not for what is contrary to God's will. We do not ask amiss with improper motives to promote our own agenda or to fulfill our own pleasure. Above all, we are to ask Heavenly Father in the name of Jesus Christ, believing that we will receive. A second element of the framework is that we receive personal revelation only within our purview and not within the prerogative of others. In other words, we take off and land in our appointed runway. The importance of well-defined runways was learned early in the history of the Restoration. Hiram Page, one of the eight witnesses to the Book of Mormon, claimed to be receiving revelations for the entire Church. Several members were deceived and wrongly influenced. In response, the Lord revealed that no one shall be appointed to receive commandments and revelations in this Church excepting my servant Joseph Smith until I shall appoint another in his stead. Doctrine, commandments, and revelations for the Church are the prerogative of the living prophet who receives them from the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the prophet's runway. Years ago, I received a phone call from an individual who had been arrested for trespassing. He told me it had been revealed to him that additional scripture was buried under the ground floor of a building he tried to enter. He claimed that once he obtained the additional scripture, he knew he had received the gift of translation, bring forth new scripture, and shape the doctrine and direction of the Church. I told him that he was mistaken, and he implored me to pray about it. I told him I wouldn't. He became verbally abusive and ended the phone call. I didn't need to pray about this request for one simple but profound reason. Only the prophet receives revelation for the Church. It would be contrary to the economy of God for others to receive such revelation which belongs on the prophet's runway. Personal revelation rightly belongs to individuals. You can receive revelation, for example, where to live, what career path to follow, or whom to marry. Church leaders may teach doctrine and share inspired counsel, but the responsibility for these decisions rests with you. That's your revelation to receive. That's your runway. A third element of the framework is that personal revelation will be in harmony with the commandments of God and the covenants we've made with Him. Consider a prayer that goes something like this. Heavenly Father, Church services are boring. May I worship Thee on the Sabbath in the mountains or on the beach. May I be excused from going to Church and partaking of the sacrament but still have the promised blessings of keeping the Sabbath day holy. In response to such a prayer, we can anticipate God's response. My child, I have already revealed my will regarding the Sabbath day. 
When we ask for revelation about something God has already given clear direction, we open ourselves up to misinterpreting our feelings and hearing what we want to hear. A man once told me about his struggles to stabilize his family's financial situation. He had the idea to embezzle funds as a solution, prayed about it, and felt he had received affirmative revelation to do so. I knew he had been deceived because he sought revelation contrary to a prophet, contrary to a commandment of God. The prophet Joseph Smith warned, Nothing is a greater injury to the children of men than to be under the influence of a false spirit when they think they have the Spirit of God. Some might point out that Nephi violated a commandment when he slew Laban. However, this exception does not negate the rule, the rule that personal revelation will be in harmony with God's commandments. No simple explanation of this episode is completely satisfactory, but let me highlight some aspects. The episode didn't begin with Nephi asking if he could slay Laban. It wasn't something he wanted to do. Killing Laban was not for Nephi's personal benefit, but to provide scriptures to a future nation and a covenant people. And Nephi was sure that it was revelation. In fact, in this case, it was a commandment from God. The fourth element of the framework is to recognize what God has already revealed to you personally while being open to further revelation from Him. If God has answered a question and the circumstances haven't changed, why would we expect the answer to be different? Joseph Smith stumbled into this problematic scenario in 1828. The first portion of the Book of Mormon had been translated when Martin Harris, a benefactor and early scribe, asked Joseph for permission to take the translated pages and show them to his wife. Unsure what to do, Joseph prayed for guidance. The Lord told him not to let Martin take the pages. Martin requested that Joseph ask God again. Joseph did so. And the answer was, not surprisingly, the same. But Martin begged Joseph to ask a third time, and Joseph did so. This time, God didn't say no. Instead, it was as though God said, Joseph, you know how I feel about this, but you have your agency to choose. Feeling himself relieved of the constraint, Joseph decided to allow Martin to take 116 manuscript pages and show them to a few family members. The translated pages were lost and never recovered. The Lord severely rebuked Joseph. Joseph learned, as the Book of Mormon prophet Jacob taught, seek not to counsel the Lord, but to take counsel from his hand, for he counseleth in wisdom. Jacob cautioned that unfortunate things happen when we ask for things we should not. He foretold that the people in Jerusalem would seek for things that they could not understand, look beyond the mark, and completely overlook the Savior of the world. They stumbled because they asked for things they would not and could not understand. If we have received personal revelation for our situation, and the circumstances haven't changed, God has already answered our question. For example, we sometimes ask repeatedly for reassurance that we've been forgiven. If we've repented, been filled with joy and peace of conscience, and received a remission of our sins, we don't need to ask again, but can trust the answer God has already given. Even as we trust God's prior answers, we need to be open to further personal revelation. After all, few of life's destinations are reached via a non-stop flight. We should recognize that personal revelation may be received line upon line and precept upon precept, that revealed direction can be and frequently is incremental. 
The elements of the framework for personal revelation are overlapping and mutually reinforcing. But within that framework, the Holy Ghost can and will reveal everything we need to soar onto and maintain momentum on the covenant path. Thus, we can be blessed by the power of Jesus Christ to become what Heavenly Father wants us to be. I invite you to have the confidence to claim personal revelation for yourself, understanding what God has revealed, consistent with the scriptures and the commandments He's given through His appointed prophets and within your own purview and agency. I know that the Holy Ghost can and will show you all things that you should do. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. As directed, the congregation will join the choir in singing, Rejoice, the Lord is King. After the, the singing, we will be pleased to hear from Elder Rafael E. Pino and Ugo Montoya of the Seventy. The choir will then sing, Brightly Beams Our Father's Mercy. We will then hear from Elder Ronald A. Rasband of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. This is the Saturday morning session of the 192nd Semi-Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I will always be grateful for my assignment in the Church that have taken me to live in different countries. 
We found in each one of these countries a great diversity and extraordinary people with different customs and traditions. We all have customs and traditions that are personal from our family or come from the community in which we live, and we hope to keep all those that align with the principles of the gospel. Edifying customs and traditions are fundamental to our efforts to stay on the covenant path, and those that are an obstacle we ought to reject. A custom is the practice or the frequent and habitual way uh, of thinking for a person, culture, or tradition. Frequently, the things we think and do in a habitual way we recognize as normal. Allow me to illustrate this. Patricia, my beloved wife, loved to drink coconut water and then to eat the coconut. During our first visit to Puebla, Mexico, we went to a place where we bought a coconut. After drinking the water, my wife asked them to cut the coconut and bring her the flesh to eat. When it came, it was reddish. They had sprinkled it with chili. Sweet coconut with chili. <laughs> that seemed so strange to us. But later, we learned that the strange ones were my wife and I, who did not eat coconut with chili. <laughs> In Mexico, however, it is not rare, it's very normal. On another occasion, we were eating in Brazil with some friends, and they served us avocado. Uh, just as we were about to sprinkle salt on it, our friend said to us, what are you doing? We already put sugar on the avocado. <laughs> avocado with sugar. <laughs> That seems so odd to us. But then we learned that the odd ones were my wife and I, who did not eat avocado with sugar. <laughs> but in Brazil, avocado sprinkled with sugar is normal. What is normal for some may be odd for others, depending on their customs and traditions. Which customs and traditions are normal in our lives? President Nelson has said, today we often hear about a new normal. If you really want to embrace a new normal, I invite you to turn your heart, mind, and soul increasingly to our Heavenly Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. Let that be your new normal. This invitation is for all. It does not matter whether we are poor or rich, educated or uneducated, old or young, sick or healthy. He invites us to let the normal things in our lives be those which keep us on the covenant path. No country uh, contains the totality of what is good or admirable. Therefore, as Paul taught, if there is anything virtuous, lovely, or of good report or praiseworthy, we seek after these things. If there be any praise, think on these things. Note that this is an exhortation, not merely a commentary. I would like all of us to take a moment to meditate on our customs and the way they are influencing our, our families. Among the marvelous and, uh, habits that should be normal for members of the church are these four. First, personal and family study of the scriptures. To become converted to the Lord Jesus Christ, each person is responsible for learning the gospel. Parents are responsible for teaching the gospel to their children. Second, personal and family prayer. The Savior commands us 
to pray always. Prayer allows us to communicate personally with our Heavenly Father in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ. Third, attend sacrament meeting weekly. We do so to remember Jesus Christ as we take the sacrament. In this ordinance, the members of the Church renew their covenant of taking upon themselves the name of the Savior, of always remembering Him and of keeping His commandments. And fourth, participate frequently in temple work and in doing family history. This work is the means of uniting and sealing families for eternity. How do we feel when we hear uh, these four things? Are they part of our normal lives? There are many other traditions that could be part of the normality we have adopted, thus letting God prevail in our lives. How can we determine what will be the normal things in our lives and in our family? In the scriptures, we find a great model. In Mosiah 5.15, it says, I would that ye should be steadfast and immovable, always abounding in good words. I love this word because we know that the things that become normal in our lives are those that, that we repeat again and again. If we are steadfast and immovable in doing good, our customs will be in accordance with the principle of the gospel, and they will help us to stay on the covenant path. President Nelson has also counseled, embrace your new normal by repenting daily. Seek to be increasingly pure in thought, word, and deed. Minister to others. Keep an eternal perspective. Magnify your callings. And whatever your challenges, my dear brothers and sisters, live each day so that you are more prepared to meet your Maker. Now, it is not all for either my wife Patricia or for me to eat coconut with chili and avocado with sugar. In fact, we like it. <laughs> However, exaltation is something much more transcendental than a sense of taste. It is a topic related to eternity. I pray that our normality may allow us to experience that state of never-ending happiness that is promised to those who keep the commandments of God. And while doing so, we may be able to say, and it came to pass that we live after the manner of happiness. My dear brothers and sisters, I testify of the 15 men whom we sustain as prophets, seers, and revelators, including our beloved prophet, President Russell M. Nelson. I testify that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is true. I especially testify of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Redeemer. In the name of Jesus Christ, Amen. Amen. The eternal principle of love is manifested by living the two great commandments. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. I remember my first winter living here in Utah. The snow everywhere, coming from the Sonoran Desert, the first day I was enjoying it, but after a few days, I realized that I had to get up earlier to remove the snow from the driveway. One morning, in the middle of a snowstorm, I was sweating, shoveling the snow, and I saw my neighbor opening his garage across the street. He's older than I am, so I thought, if I can finish soon, I could help him. 
So raising my voice, I asked, brother, do you need help? He smiled and said, thank you, Elder Montoya. Then he pulled a snowblower out of his garage. <laughs> I started the engine, and in a few minutes, he removed all the snow in front of his house. He then crossed the street with his machine and asked me, Elder, do you need help? <laughs> with a smile, I said, yes, thank you. We are willing to help each other because we love each other. And my brother's needs become my needs, and mine become his. No matter what language my brother speaks or what country he comes from, we love each other because we are brothers, children of the same father. When ministering was announced, President Nelson said, we will implement a newer, holier approach to caring for and ministering to others. To me, holier means more personal, deeper, more like the Savior's way have love one to another, one by one. It is not enough to avoid being nice to be blocked for others. It is not enough to notice the needy on the road and pass by. Let us take advantage of every opportunity to help our neighbor, even if it is the first and only time we meet him in this life. Why is love for God the first great commandment? I think it's because of what He means to us. We are His children. He oversees our welfare. We are dependent on Him, and he, His love protects us. His plan includes agency. Therefore, we will likely make some mistakes. He also allows us to be tested and tempted. But whether we are making some mistakes or falling into temptation, the plans provides a savior so we can be redeemed and returned to the presence of God. Adversity in our lives can cause doubt about the fulfillment of the promises that have been made to us. Please trust in our Father. He always keeps his promises, and we can learn what he wants to teach us. Even doing what is right, the circumstances in our life can change from good to bad, from happiness to sadness. God answers our prayers according to His infinite mercy, love, and in His own time. The brook where Elijah drank water dried up. Nephi's fine steel bow was broken. A young boy was discriminated against and expelled from the school. A long-awaited fourth child died within days of being born. Circumstances change. When circumstances change from good and positive to bad and negative, we can still be happy because happiness does not depend on the circumstances, but on our attitude toward the circumstances. President Nelson said, the joy we feel has little to do with the circumstances of our lives and everything to do with the focus of our lives. We can sit back and wait for circumstances to change in their own, or we can look for and bring about new circumstances. Elijah walked to Seraphat, where a widow gave him food and drink. Nephi made a wooden bull and hunted animals to it. The young boy sat listening and taking notes by the window, and today he is an elementary school teacher. The couple has developed a great faith in the Savior, Jesus Christ, and trust in the plan of salvation. Their love for the long-awaited child who died suddenly is greater than their grief. When I hear the question, Heavenly Father, are you really there? And do you hear and answer every child's prayer? I like to answer. He has been. He is. And he will always be there for you and me. I am his son. He is my father. And I am learning to be a good father as he is. My wife and I always try to be there for our children at any time, under any condition and by any means. 
Each child is unique. Their word to God is great. And no matter what challenges and sins and weaknesses they have, God loves them, and so do we. When I received this call as a general authority on the last day before our travel to Salt Lake, all my children and their families were together in our home for a family home evening, where we expressed our love and gratitude. After the lesson, I gave a priesthood blessing to each one of my children. Everyone was in tears. After the blessing, my oldest son expressed words of gratitude in behalf of everyone for the great love that we had given them for the day they were born until then. Bless your children, whether they are five or 50 years old. Be with them. Be for them. Although providing is a responsibility established by divine design, we must not forget to share joyful time with our children. Our Heavenly Father's love for each of His children is real. He is there for each one. I don't know how He does it, but He does. He and His firstborn are one in doing the work and glory of the Father to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of men. They have sent us the Holy Ghost to guide us, to warn us, to comfort us if necessary. He instructed His beloved Son to create this beautiful earth he instructed Adam and Eve and gave them to them their agency. He has been sending messengers for years and years so that we can receive His love and His commandments. He was in the sacred grove answering John Joseph's sincere question and calling him by his name. He said, This is my beloved son. Hear him. I believe that the supreme demonstration of God's love for us happened in Gethsemane where the Son of the living God prayed, Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. I have noticed that the small portion that I can understand of the Atonement of Jesus Christ increases my love for the Father and His Son, decreases my desire to, be, to sin and to be disobedient, and increases my willingness to be better and do better. Jesus walked with no fear and with no doubt to Gethsemane, trusting in his Father. Knowing that he must tread the winepress alone, he endured all pain and all humiliation. He was accused, judged, and crucified. During his own agony and suffering on the cross, Jesus focused on the needs of his mother and his beloved disciple. He offered his life. On the third day, he was resurrected. The tomb is empty. He stands on the right hand of his Father. They hope we, we, they hope we will choose to keep our covenants and return to their presence. This second state is not our final state. We do not belong to this earthly home, but rather we are eternal beings living temporary experiences. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and He lives. And because He lives, all of God's children will live forever. And thanks to His atoning sacrifice, we cannot live together with them. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.
My dear brothers and sisters, in the Book of Mormon, the phrase, this day, is used repeatedly to call attention to counsel, promises, and teachings. King Benjamin, in his final address, admon admonished the people, Hear my words, which I shall speak unto you this day. Open your ears that ye may hear, and your hearts that ye may understand, and your minds that the mysteries of God may be unfolded to your view. General Conference is a similar setting. We come to hear counsel for this day, that we may be true at all times to the Lord and His gospel. Pressing upon me this day is the importance of renewing our commitment to the Book of Mormon, which Joseph Smith called the most correct of any book on earth. I hold in my hand a copy of the Book of Mormon. This is my 1970 vintage edition, and it is precious to me. By its appearance, it is tired and worn, but no other book is as important to my life and my testimony as this one. Reading it, I gained a witness by the Spirit that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He is my Savior, that these scriptures are the Word of God, and that the gospel is restored. Those truths rest deep within me. As the prophet Nephi said, my soul delighteth in the things of the Lord. Here is the backstory. As a young missionary, I took the counsel of Elder Marion D. Hanks, who visited us in the Eastern States Mission. He was the former president of the British Mission, and two of his missionaries are on the stand this day, my dear brethren, Elder Jeffrey R. Holland and Elder Quentin L. Cook. Just as with his missionaries in England, he challenged us to read an unmarked copy of the Book of Mormon at least two times. I took up the task. The first reading I was to mark or underline everything that pointed to or testified of Jesus Christ. I used a red pencil and I underlined many passages. The second time, Elder Hank said to highlight principles and doctrine of the gospel, and this time I used blue to mark the scriptures. I read the Book of Mormon twice, as suggested, and then two more times, using yellow and black to mark passages that stood out to me. As you can see, I made many notations. There was much more to my reading than just marking scriptures. With each reading of the Book of Mormon front to back, I was filled with a profound love for the Lord. I felt a deeply rooted witness of the truth of His teachings and how they apply to this day. This book fits its title, Another Testament of Jesus Christ. With that study and the spiritual witness that was received, I became a Book of Mormon missionary and a disciple of Jesus Christ. This day, one of the greatest missionaries of the Book of Mormon is President Russell M. Nelson. When he was a newly called apostle, he was giving a lecture in Accra, Ghana. In attendance were dignitaries, including an African tribal king, with whom he spoke through an interpreter. The king was a serious student of the Bible and loved the Lord. Following his remarks, he was approached by that king who asked in perfect English, Just who are you? President Nelson explained he was an ordained apostle of Jesus Christ. The king's next question was, What can you teach me about Jesus Christ? President Nelson reached for the Book of Mormon and opened it to 3 Nephi chapter 11. Together, President Nelson and the king read the Savior's sermon to the Nephites. Behold, I am Jesus Christ, whom the prophets testified shall come into the world. I am the light and the life of the world. President Nelson presented the king with that copy of the Book of Mormon, and the king responded. 
You could have given me diamonds or rubies, but nothing is more precious to me than this additional knowledge about the Lord Jesus Christ. That is not an isolated example of how our beloved prophet shares the Book of Mormon. He has given copies of the Book of Mormon to hundreds of people, always bearing his witness of Jesus Christ. When President Nelson meets with guests, presidents, kings, heads of state, leaders of business and organizations, and of diverse faiths, whether at church headquarters or in their own locations, he reverently presents this book of revealed scripture. He could give them so many things wrapped in ribbons that might sit on a table or desk or in cabinets as a reminder of his visit. Instead, he gives what is most precious to him, far beyond rubies and diamonds, as the tribal king described. The truths of the Book of Mormon, President Nelson said, have the power to heal, comfort, restore, succor, strengthen, console, and cheer our souls. I have watched as these copies of the Book of Mormon have been clutched in the hands of those who have received them from our prophet of God. There could be no greater gift. Just recently, he met with the First Lady of the Gambia in his office and humbly handed her a Book of Mormon. He did not stop there. He opened its pages to read with her to teach and testify of Jesus Christ, His Atonement, and His love for all His children everywhere. Our living prophet is doing his part to flood the earth with the Book of Mormon, but he cannot open the floodgates alone. We must follow his lead. Inspired by his example, I have been trying to humbly and more fervently share the Book of Mormon. Recently, I was on assignment in Mozambique. The citizens of this beautiful country are struggling with poverty, poor health, unemployment, storms, and political unrest. I had the honor of meeting with the country's president, Felipe Nayusi. At his request, I prayed for him and his nation. I told him we were building a temple of Jesus Christ in his country. At the end of our visit, I presented to him a copy of the Book of Mormon in Portuguese, his native language, and he gratefully accepted the book. I testified of the hope and promise for his people found in the Lord's words on its pages. On another occasion, my wife Melanie and I met with the King and Queen Letsi III of Lesotho at their home. For us, the highlight, highlight of our visit was presenting them with a copy of the Book of Mormon and then sharing my testimony. When I look back on that experience and others, a verse of Latter-day Scripture comes to mind. The fullness of my gospel might be proclaimed by the weak and the simple unto the ends of the world and before kings and rulers. I have shared the Book of Mormon with India's Ambassador Pandey to the United Nations in Geneva and with His Holiness Patriarch Bartholomew of the Eastern Orthodox Church and many others. I have felt the Spirit of the Lord with us as I have personally handed them this keystone of our religion and borne my witness of Jesus Christ, the cornerstone of our faith. Now, brothers and sisters, you do not have to go to Mozambique or India or meet with kings and rulers to give someone this book of sacred teaching and promises. I invite you this day to give a Book of Mormon to your friends and family, associates at work, your soccer coach, or the produce man at your market. They need the words of the Lord found in this book. They need answers to the questions of everyday life and of eternal life to come. They need to know of the covenant path laid out before them and the Lord's abiding love for them. It's all here in the Book of Mormon. 
When you hand them a Book of Mormon, you are opening their minds and hearts to the Word of God. You do not need to carry printed copies of the book with you. You can easily share it from your mo mobile phone from the Scriptures section of the Gospel Library app. Think of all those who could be blessed by the gospel in their lives and then send to them a copy of the Book of Mormon from your phone. Remember to include your testimony and how this book has blessed your life. My dear friends, as an apostle of the Lord, I invite you to follow our beloved prophet, President Nelson, in flooding the earth with the Book of Mormon. The need is so great. We need to act now. I promise you will be participating in the greatest work on earth, the gathering of Israel, as you are inspired to reach out to those who have been kept from the truth because they know not where to find it. They need your testimony and witness of how this book has changed your life and drawn you closer to God, His peace and His tidings of great joy. I testify that by divine design, the Book of Mormon was prepared in ancient America to come forth to declare God's word, to bring souls to the Lord Jesus Christ and His restored gospel this day. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. We express gratitude to the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square for the beautiful music they have provided this morning. The concluding speaker for this session will be our beloved prophet, President Russell M. Nelson. Following his remarks, the choir will close this meeting by singing, All Creatures of our God and King. The benediction will then be offered by Elder Taylor G. Godoy of the 70. My beloved brothers and sisters, thanks to all for this inspiring session. Since our conference last April, we have witnessed many world events, ranging from the heartbreaking to the sublime. We're delighted with reports of large youth conferences being held throughout the world. At these conferences, our noble youth are learning that no matter what happens in their lives, their greatest strength comes from the Lord. We rejoice that more temples are being built across the world. With the dedication of each new temple, additional godly power comes into the world to strengthen us and counteract the intensifying efforts of the adversary. Abuse constitutes the influence of the adversary. It is a grievous sin. As President of the Church, I affirm the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ on this issue. Let me be perfectly clear any kind of abuse of women, children, or anyone is an abomination to the Lord. He grieves and I grieve whenever anyone is harmed. He mourns and we all mourn 
for each person who has fallen victim to abuse of any kind. Those who per perpetrate these hideous acts are not only accountable to the laws of man, but will also face the wrath of Almighty God. For decades now, the Church has taken extensive measures to protect, in particular, children from abuse. There are many aids on the Church website. I invite you to study them. These guidelines are in place to protect the innocent. I urge each of us to be alert to anyone who might be in danger of being abused and to act promptly to protect them. The Savior will not tolerate abuse, and as his disciples, neither can we. The adversary has other disturbing tactics. Among them are his efforts to blur the line between what is true and what is not true. The flood of information available at our fingertips, ironically, makes it increasingly difficult to determine what is true. This challenge reminds me of an experience Sister Nelson and I had when we visited a dignitary in a country where relatively few people have heard of Jesus Christ. This dear aging friend had recently been quite ill. He told us that during his many days in bed, he often stared at the ceiling and asked, what is true? Many on earth today are only kept from the truth because they know not where to find it. Some would have us believe that truth is relative, that each person should determine for himself or herself what is true. Such a belief is but wishful thinking for those who mistakenly think they will not also be accountable to God. Dear brothers and sisters, God is the source of all truth. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints embraces all truth that God conveys to his children, whether learned in a scientific laboratory or received by direct revelation from him. From this pulpit, Today and tomorrow you will continue to hear truth. Please make notes of thoughts that catch your attention and those that come into your mind and stay in your heart. Prayerfully ask the Lord to confirm that what you have heard is true. I love you, my dear brothers and sisters. I pray that this conference will provide the spiritual feast you are seeking. In the sacred name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Thank you.
Our gracious Father in heaven, at the conclusion of this first session, we humbly come before thee with our hearts full of joy and love for thee, to express our deepest gratitude for the many blessings we receive from thee. We are so grateful for thy Son, Jesus Christ, and his atoning sacrifice, and the opportunity we have to be healed and forgiven. We are grateful for our living prophet, President Russell M. Nelson, for his counselors, a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. Please bless them, protect them, and inspire them. And please bless us with thy spirit, that our minds and hearts may be open during this weekend to feel and to know how we can be better disciples of Christ. We ask thee to bless those in need, those struggling. Please strengthen them and comfort them. And please bless the youth, the missionaries, and the returned missionaries throughout the world with thy spirit. We love the Heavenly Father, and we express that this humble prayer in the name of our shepherd, thy son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. This has been a broadcast of the Saturday morning session of the 192nd Semi-Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Speakers were selected from leaders of the church. Music was provided by the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square. This broadcast has been furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited.